we would like to acknowledge the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates. Toronto has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee peoples, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This territory was the subject of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. The treaties that were signed for this particular parcel of land are collectively referred to as the Williams Treaties of 1923. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still home to many ind Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. Thank you, Mosca. Good evening, everyone, and salam alaikum. May peace be with you. Welcome and thank you for joining the first event by the Institute of Islamic Studies on the Muslims in Canada Archives. I am delighted to be speaking with you from the University of Toronto as part of the advancement team with the Faculty of Arts and Science. The Institute of Islamic Studies is a part of this faculty and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to today's program. Today's event is the first of a three-part web series focusing on the value of archives as well as a tribute to a giant in the community we lost recently, Dr. Dawood Hamdani. For those who are interested in attending the next two events, the second event of the series will be taking place uh, next week on Tuesday, December 15th, and it will feature a conversation between archivist Mosca Rukai and Hassan, uh, historian Hassan Munir on how archival material helps us better understand the rich history of Muslims in Canada. The third event of the series will take place in the new year on January 12th, and it will be focusing on how you as a community can get involved uh, with the archives in terms of providing archive worthy contributions and having them preserved at the archive, um, as well as anyone who's interested in helping to permanently endow the archive with a financial donation. So that's what we have uh, planned over the next few weeks at the Institute. And now we'll bring it back to today's program. Uh, we can have the agenda. Um, we'll begin with welcome and introductory remarks by the director of the Institute of Islamic Studies, Dr. Anwar Iman. This will be followed by a tribute to Dr. Dawood Hamdani. We will then have archivist Mosca Rokai walk us through the Muslims in Canada Archives Initiative. Following this, we will share with you next steps planned at the Institute of Islamic Studies and at which point we will open up the program to take any questions from the audience. Uh, you will not be able to unmute yourselves, but you will be able to type your questions in the Q&A chat box below. You can feel free to even start sending your questions in from now if you like. So with that, allow me to introduce you to the heart, soul, and brains behind the Institute of Islamic Studies, Dr. Anwar Iman. Dr. Iman is no ordinary individual. Uh, over the past couple of years, some of you have heard me speak about him, whether in relation to the uh, CRA study, the CSIS hotline, or the mere fact that such a remarkable institute exists at the University of Toronto. And so now we'll finally hear from him. If you haven't met him already, uh, you'll have the pleasure of uh, getting to know him in just a moment. So Dr. Iman, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fatima. Assalamu alaikum uh, to everyone. And thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, just as a, as a, as part of uh, introducing you and welcoming you to our community of scholars and and, uh, and 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 intellectual leaders here, I wanted to give you just an introduction to the institute. The institute's been around for a number of years at the University of Toronto. I took over as director in 2018, and one of the key things I wanted to do with the institute is leverage uh, academic excellence for public engagement in a way that the universities are well positioned to do and. Uh, one of the first things that I did was do a community consultation. Many organizations and their leaders, many of whom are here on this on this webinar today, were at were at a meeting uh, back in September 2018 or some meetings thereafter, where we discussed what are the kinds of things that are useful for an institution like the University of Toronto to do, to engage in, and the kinds of work that could um, both both propel the study of Islam, which is one of my mandates as an academic at the U of T, but also integrate it within the larger conversations happening around the world. And so the Institute has become a dynamic place for young scholars, and you'll meet two of them today, Mosca Roque, who's our archivist, and Sarah Shaw, who's our, uh, who's our data specialist. 
who do some remarkable work and have already done some remarkable work on a number of projects at the Institute. Um, by now, maybe you've heard of the Institute, perhaps uh, from some of the media coverage that we got on when we launched our hotline for U of T students approached by CSIS. Um, and some of you might also know a little bit about the project that we're doing in collaboration with NCCM, which is on the, uh, Canada, uh, the, the Canada Revenue Agency and its audits of Muslim-led charities. That's a project that's underway. And uh, I believe there's a community consultation next week that NCCM is hosting. And I look forward to seeing some of you there. But uh, three projects that we're developing now that may be of interest um, is of course the Muslims in Canada Archives project or MICA as we call it. And you'll be hearing about that today from Mosca, our chief archivist. An Islamophobia research lab, research and innovation lab, one that really is only in partnership with community organizations and is led uh, through initiatives uh, and the initiative of, of community partners. Um, and the idea there is of course to think hard about Islamophobia as a rising feature of Canadian society. Um, in many ways, the CRA report is an uh, instantiation of that. And then of course, there's the Muslims in Canada the data initiative, a data initiative that, that is really about trying to think about Muslims as a demographic uh, group and how to speak from numbers to policymakers. All of these initiatives are really attempts by which to inscribe Muslims into the fabric of Canada. And in many ways, uh, that's kind of how I understand um, Dr. Hamdani's efforts. I never got to meet him, but when I first assumed the role of director, I was told, you've got to try to connect with Dawood Hamdani. He's the one who's done all these data reports. He's the one that's really think, tried to think hard about Muslims in Canada. And so we had conversations over the phone and exchanges over email. And that's when I began to realize here was a gentleman who recognized the value of talking statistically. He was a person who recognized the value of thinking of Muslims today as making history. And you know, as, as much as if you were if you were raised by a mother like mine, you would know, you know, the idea that we are making history in the moment seems a little bit arrogant for us to say. But the fact is, is that generations after us are going to want to know what it is we did for them, to, uh, to them, to support them, not just our children wondering how we screw them up, but generations of, of folks wondering what kind of leadership was, was presented by Muslims in Canada to contribute to Canada's heritage, which of which there is extensive. And so in many ways, that's how Daoud's history and his legacy um, has inspired us. And so to that end, let me introduce you to two people. You, um, you have, uh, you, you, one person you're going to meet today is Mosca, Mosca Rokai, who is a recent graduate of the Information Management School here at the University of Toronto. And when I was looking for developing an archive, uh, an archive project, it was clear to me that we needed to think um, in a manner that emphasized diversity, in a manner that emphasized uh, the recognition that multiple communities are contributing to Canada's heritage, but not all those communities are represented in the way Canada's arch archival landscape captures who and what contributes. And in fact, hiring Mosca was, uh, was one of the first things I did, and she came highly recommended by U of T's chief archivist. Uh, since then, she has not only has she uh, published her thesis, she's won awards from the, from the Canadian Archivist Association, from uh, Arch Archivaria, I think is the name of the, and uh, unless you're an archivist, a nerd, um, you, these awards may not make a lot of sense to you, but for us, what they signal is her excellence in the world of archival leadership, archival practice, and professionalism, and that's what exactly she she brings to uh, to the to, to Mica, and she's been doing that ever since. Fatima, who you know, many of you will know, we were uh, we we brought her into the U of T from NCCM, formerly with NCCM. She now is part of our environment here at the University of Toronto within the Advancement um, Office, trying to help us expand our reach and ensure that. Also, the work that we do um, resonates with the larger context in which we're in, the context that you represent as attendees in this event. We're so delighted to have Fatim as part of our team. And she's added, uh, in the short time that she's been here, she's already been transformative of how we are thinking about uh, advancing the agenda at the IAS. So with that, I'm going to, um, I'm going to turn it over back to Fatima and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back periodically throughout. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Iman, appreciate that. And now for a tribute to Dr. Dawood Hamdani, an individual whose work over many years continues to provide rich insights and analysis into the Muslim community and continues to have wide reaching effects. 
Um, I personally had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Hamdani in several capacities, including consulting him on various community initiatives, as well as being fortunate enough to call him a close family friend. Um, as you heard from Dr. Iman, the Institute uh, felt a tribute to Dr. Hamdani was the least we could do for everything he gave us. Um, and really it's individuals like Dr. Hamdani and those who came before him and those among you uh, whose contributions are part of our community's legacy, which needs to be part of this archive. Other communities before us have established archives and there currently isn't one for our community until today. So with that, uh, there are a few individuals we've identified, we've lined up for today to share a few words about Dr. Hamdani uh, and the impact he's made on them and the communities they serve. Uh, we'll begin with um, Brother Hassam Munir, uh, a Master of History student at the University of Toronto to say a few words. Uh, Hassam, the floor is yours, please. Assalamualaikum everyone, uh, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, part of this event and to pay tribute to someone who was and is an inspiration uh, for me, Dr. Dawood Hamdani. I believe I first came across Dr. Hamdani's work in uh, 2013. Uh, and I remember my excitement at reading about how a Scottish family with the surname Love had settled in Canada in the 1850s and how they had identified themselves as Muslims in the 1871 census. And just looking at those years and um, what that uh, kind of indicated or suggested about the longevity of the presence of Muslims in the land known as Canada. Uh, that was an incre incredible feeling for me at the time. Um, history is crucial to forming identity, as we all know. So for me, as a Canadian Muslim, not only was it fascinating research um, that inspired me and compelled me to start digging further and seeing how I could contribute and how I could build on Brother Hamdani's work and do my own research to uncover more of the history of Muslims in Canada, which is what I've been trying to do for the past several years. But on a more personal level, it really enriched my, uh, my sense of belonging, my sense of home, my sense of community, uh, even my sense of responsibility to this land known as Canada and to Canadian communities, the Muslim community, as well as others, particularly marginalized communities. I was a young undergraduate student at the time. Uh, I wasn't even studying history at the time, although I always had a strong interest in history, but Dr. Hamdani taught me that we are all a part of history and, uh, or history in the making as well. And we can all find ways to contribute to the effort to reconstruct and preserve our history for future generations. He was strictly not a historian, but he was curious, he was resourceful, he was eager. And with these qualities, he made a contribution that has inspired so many people in so many ways. Sadly, Dr. Hamdani passed away before I got to meet him in person, but I hope and pray that uh, we will meet in a better place, inshallah. I'm honored to have the opportunity to do my part to continue the work uh, that he started for us all. And I think the Muslims in Canada archives or MICA is a very important part of that same effort. And I really think he would have been very supportive of this initiative because it carries the same spirit that he embodied of bringing together and sharing the resources we have as communities to ultimately be able to tell our own stories. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing, Hassan. Uh, now I'll ask uh, Marie Hogman if you can please unmute yourself and share a few words. Ta-da! There. Hi, Assalamualaikum, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to see you all on, on this a very auspicious occasion. Uh, Daoud, I've met a number of times over the years, I guess probably through areas uh, with the Canadian Council of Muslim Women, because there are often meetings or other Islamic events and I would run into him, we would have chats. And then once I discovered what he was doing, uh, it became a very key part of the book that I've finished, which is now being edited, which is, uh, if I give myself a plug here, um, Minarets on the Skyline, which is the new upcoming title coming out in uh, the spring, inshallah. But uh, his basis of these early, early numbers from the early Scots um, through to the massive numbers, and I lived through that stuff, with the Muslim Society of Toronto, both Ari and I. So I, I really got a feeling for that development of history and I commend uh, Hassam for all the work he's been doing. 
but I guess my role here is just to give a brief sketch of what he told me when I interviewed him um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and I was still trying to check with a few with him in vain, as it turned out, nobody ever told us that he in fact had died. So I was really embarrassed about that because I had been up to see him several times in Ottawa uh, and we had chatted about various things and about the book and how it was going and bits of information he might help with or things I thought he would find interesting because he was just a great man and when I wanted to spend some time with him. So what he told me, and if you mind, won't mind me just kind of skimming through things, he told me that he had born and been born in 1939 in a place called Farozpur uh, in what was then British India. Um, his, it came from a good background for his Islamic work, his, his later Islamic work, in that his father was a professor of uh, Persian and Arabic at the University of Punjab. Um, when partition came along, of course, he was a, still a small boy, uh, they, their house was attacked by Hindu and Muslim mobs, and they were whisked off, saved by one of his father's students, who was in the military, and I guess he saw the family fleeing, and so he took them into, uh, put them into a, a kind of barbed wire enclosure where they were just dumped for a couple of days with, with not much in the way of anything. Uh, and then luckily they got on to uh, train to Pakistan uh, with a rather ominous name. But anyway, they, he said they saw dead and dying people in the streets and so on, but they got there and they landed on their feet. Uh, he was able to go to school there, a thing called um, Islamia, Islamia College, I think it was. And then he went into the university um, and he then graduated uh, and went off on a scholarship to, to Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, he was not tempted by music and went on with economics, which was his uh, dodge. And he did that and graduated with a PhD in 65. Uh, in 65, I, I was wondering where he was going with his life and how we're going to fit into this, what I was doing. But anyway, he did, in fact, um, come to uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, the, the rock in, in 1965 uh, to Memorial University. And he said there were only, he only knew two other Muslims. And so I have to uh, assume that they were pretty thin and uh, thin on the ground there in those days. Um, but he, so he stayed there, uh, presumably doing economics for uh, not very long. Um, and then in 66, he came to here to, to Kingston, to Queen's University, um, where he um, became a research fellow at the Institute of, uh, for Public Policy. Um, and he mentioned that he had joined in the Queen's prayers. And I was, I didn't come to Kingston until 73. So I joined those prayers later on, of course. Um, but then he didn't stay there long in 67. Then he went um, to become a teaching fellow at the University of Toronto, uh, where he again met up with a number of these people that we know as, as Muslim pioneers, the Dr. Fawad Shaheen and Moeen Moeen and a variety of people um, in those days. He was again in, in the field of economics. Um, in 73, then he moved to Ottawa, uh, where he said he was the first Muslim in the Department of Finance. Um, and uh, but he was not sort of really involved in, 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 uh, in Islamic matters particularly, but somewhere along the line, uh, after the, the oil em embargo in the 1979 Iranian revolution, uh, an institute called the, uh, what is it? the Toronto School of Theology said, well, would you give, uh, give us a talk on Muslims in Canada, which he found he knew particularly little about, and there was really no material around either. So that kind of put a uh, bug in his ear at it, about it. So he went on and on the side then, aside from his work, uh, looking into the National Archives in Ottawa and digging through microfiches. And eventually, with the help of one of the librarians, he was able to narrow down an area where there might be some Muslims. And sure enough, he started looking up the census. And the first one that, that was relevant was uh, 1871. And bang, 13 Mohammedans. And he couldn't quite believe, that, I guess, the old print. And of course, microfiche is not good for the, for the eyes anyway. But anyway, so he said, asked the other guy, I said, well, come over and, you know, what does that say? And it said, Muhammad. And so he said, Alhamdulillah. And he went on from there. And of course, then he developed 
and his estimates uh, over the years, looking at the censuses and working out where they were. Um, and again, there were just that 13 in, in 71, uh, in 1871, that is, uh, my, my fellow Scots and uh, the, the loves and some Americans uh, who, I don't know whether Hassam found that for me, somebody did anyway. Um, but he went on working and of course, then finally, uh, he, he retired. Uh, he retired in 2004 and then he was really free to kind of start doing uh, more work on Islamic subjects. And he, he got a job, or he, got a, he was called back to work by uh, Statistics Canada and that kind of gave him more in, insight. So he really started writing these articles which we all know about, uh, which were very good on the basis of understanding the Muslim community and where it had been, what it was doing. Um, I just want to just in winding up here, uh, he said that one of the things that he was it, he thought about all this experience was that the Muslims ought to have paid more attention to developing their their sense of community and also of getting in touch and working with the Canadian society. Um, uh, so he went he went on with that that kind of work which you all know about. Um, and I, I've always called him the, the dean of kind of Islamic you know, historical research because he was really just that. And just a nice, nice, quiet, sweet, quiet man. I really missed him. Uh, and I say he died in November uh, last year, so just over a year ago. Um, but he, uh, he was a good man and did a lot of good work for the CMCC, or this, the, the, the CCMW rather, and... Uh, that's a good segue to uh, Nusat, I guess. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mary. Thank you for sharing all those details. Much appreciated. Can I just add a little something, Fatma? <clears throat> I think you, was, sure. Nusat is going to talk more about, but he, as Mary said, he really was a lovely, lovely man. And he did so much work for CCMW um, because he believed in, in, in the kind of work uh, to do with Muslims in Canada. <clears throat> so I just want to say that I hope he, he will live with all of us for many, many years to come. Sadly, he has only one son and none of us can find the son. Did you find him at all? I, I've been un, we've been unable to reach him. Just, mm -hmm. there we are. Yeah, we've actually made attempts as well, uh, both uh, Dr. Iman and myself and through some uh, contacts in the community, we haven't been able to, but we can definitely continue this conversation uh, perhaps during the Q&A. Uh, thank you so much for, for your insights. Really appreciate you sharing those details and heartfelt comments about uh, Dawood Uncle, much appreciated. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, Nusat Jafri, the Executive Director of the Canadian Council of Muslim Women uh, to share a few words as well. I think I'm unmuted. Uh, so salam everyone and salam Alia, my predecessor. Um, and of course, uh, Marie and um, all of the other friends that are here uh, that are on the, the panel with me and also in the audience. So I'm really, really happy to come and talk to you about Dawood Hamlani. So Dawood, um, did some work with CCMW about 20 years ago, actually, or shortly after the 2001 census. Um, he was very interested in, uh, in learning or doing more work on Canadian Muslim women. He had been looking at the demographics uh, of Muslims already, generally, but nothing had been done specifically about Canadian Muslim women. So we engaged him initially to do a, a very um, detailed study, both qualitative and quantitative study of issues that were faced by Canadian Muslim women. So he, uh, he did the research and we published the first work by him. It was Engaging Muslim Women Issues and Needs. Um, and it has, it, it's, it's a very broad publication that has a lot of information about what Canadian Muslim women were facing at the time that the book was, uh, or the publication was prepared. Um, after that, we uh, did, did a number of studies with him. He led uh, a number of demographic studies that focused on the results of the 2001 census, because at that time, um, the religion question was in fact included in the census. So um, we were able to publish really uh, 
quite groundbreaking studies on uh, the demographics of Canadian Muslim women. Um, the first one was uh, Muslim women beyond perception. So it was a, it was really a myth busting uh, publication that showed uh, that Muslim women were very well educated. They had the second highest level of education uh, among all uh, groups in Canada. And uh, they were highly underemployed or unemployed at a higher rate compared with other populations. Um, but what was really interesting, there was some other data that were really interesting too in that study. Um, so we, we, we learned a lot about Canadian Muslim women through that uh, publication. Then he did two other um, studies still based on um, the, the census and other data sources. One was called um, Triple, Je sorry, Triple Jeopardy. The, it was Muslim women's experience of discrimination. So it looked at the triple jeopardy faced by Canadian Muslim women being Muslim, being female, um, and uh, of course, being a person of color more often than not. Um, and then the, the other publication he did for us was on Muslim women's participation in uh, politics. It was called Muslim Women's Participation um, in Political Participation from Polling Booths to Parliament. And at that time, there were very few Muslim women in parliament at any level. So he, he documented who they were and how many had run for office at that time or by that time. So these are really groundbreaking studies never before uh, done about Canadian Muslim women. Um, and uh, two other publications he did for us that were really exciting and maybe uh, Hassam, you've seen them. Uh, one was on the Al Rashid Mosque, Canada's first mosque. So uh, CCMW actually played a very key role in preserving that mosque in Edmonton. Um, our, our members there had uh, saved that mosque from demolition. So he, he was inspired by the work that our organization had done. So he wrote a, a history of the mosque, uh, which we published. And then another really wonderful little booklet he did was in the footsteps of Canadian Muslim women, 1837 to 2007. We published that on the occasion of our 25th anniversary. And of course it does start with Agnes Love who uh, was born in 1837 and she came to Canada at age 15 and the rest is history. Um, after all of these wonderful publications, uh, we had, we engaged Daoud again to look at the two, 2011 census and also other data sources uh, to do another profile, demographic profile of Canadian Muslim women. So we published a Canadian Muslim women, a decade of change, 2001 to 2011. Um, all of these publications are available on the CCMW website. Um, what was really amazing was that we didn't really have to ask um, Though to do this work, he would voluntarily come forward and say, um, you know, have you thought about doing this? Uh, he got us started on this, this path to look at our demographics on a regular basis. So in fact, um, the tradition continues and we've actually engaged Sarah Shaw, who's, who's with the Institute right now and she's, um, she's working with, with Anwar, who's doing um, a, the, this research project that features uh, the census data from 2016 and also using other data sources. And she's also doing a really in-depth um, qualitative study for us. So he's, he got us started on looking at Canadian Muslim women and their demographics, their socioeconomic conditions. Uh, we've added their health issues in the, the latest work that we're doing with Sarah. Um, but, but really we have to thank Daoud for it because he got us started. And if it hadn't been for him if, and his inspiration, we wouldn't be able to, to do the work. And also he's left us quite a legacy. So if you're interested in any of these amazing sources, you can find almost all of them on our website at the Canadian Council of Muslim Women, ccmw.com. Great, thank you so thank much, Nasat, appreciate it. Um, now we'll ask uh, Mo Lada, who is one of the founding board members of the, the Canadian Muslim Vote, to say a few words. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, 
Let me just uh, begin by uh, thanking uh, Anvar and uh, Fatima and Sarah and, and Raksa for taking on this initiative. Um, the entire team that works at Mike, I was excited by you know, the concept and the idea of Micah when it was first shared with me, and I continue to be excited uh, by the prospect of contributing to this work. I hope in the next couple of statements, I'll be able to describe um, both the impact that Dawood Hamdani had on me and, and on the Canadian Muslim vote, uh, but also um, on why I think this work is continues to be so important to his, uh, to his legacy. So sometime in, uh, in the mid uh, 2014, early 2015, I had um, I had been recruited um, by my friends and and my conscience to participate in a in a project uh, that would over the next few years um, draw our our combined focus and attention into a world that none of us had much experience with. Um, it was a project in in civic engagement. At the at the time, our our project had a working name. Um, it was called Get Out the Muslim Vote. We didn't really have a, a brand for it yet. Um, I see Fatima smiling. I, I suspect she, she remembers that. Um, we were a, a band of kind of mostly mid-career private sector corporate types who had uh, identified uh, and were pursuing an important social need to increase participation of Muslims at the polls in Canada, where voter turnout had been abysmal historically. The best guesstimates placed it at maybe half of the national average. And while our purpose was slowly defining itself, um, as we came to understand from political, social, and academic advisors, that at the base of influencing politics and policy was participation. If Muslims in Canada were to have a voice in the public sphere, if we were to seek to shape the political discourse, then active engagement was necessary. And in a political context, that began at the polls. We know now that it does not end at the polls, but that is a, a different conversation. At the time, we began to flounder a little bit. Not that we weren't trying, but we didn't seem to have a clear picture, an understanding of who and what Canadian Muslims were. As importantly as understanding them for the purposes of being able to connect with them, we needed to be able to tell their stories to policymakers. And while we knew each other, a few handful of volunteers that fortunately came from diverse communities, um, we were not even a drop in the proverbial pond of what were at that time somewhere between 1.1 and 1.2 million Muslims that existed in Canada from coast to coast. Without knowing them and without understanding their demographic makeup, we were gonna have a terribly difficult time of trying to reach this greater than 1 million people. Um, and we were gonna have an even harder time of selling their story to policymakers. And then as it often does, serendipity happened. We were fortunate to have been invited uh, to, a, to join a meeting that was put on by the Dawn Foundation um, at which uh, what I saw as Dr. Hamdani's seminal research on Canadian Muslims was presented. Um, now, I may have thought it was seminal, but clearly from what we've heard today, he was um, quite prolific. So it was just my first introduction to his work. His research essentially gave us the answers by telling us about the demographic story of Muslims in Canada. It told us who they were. It told us where they were, what issues they cared about, and how to reach them through with enough breadth and precision that it became possible to devise a plan to engage Canadian Muslims in civic and in this case, political society. We learned that at the time, almost a third of Canadian Muslims were Canadian born, while two thirds were immigrants. We learned that they came from so many different countries, Pakistan, Iran, Morocco, Algeria, Afghanistan, I, the, the list goes on and on. It's amazing how much we did not know about who these communities were. Reflecting the places that they came from, the majority of their makeup uh, of the population um, came from a Sunni background. And amongst the minority Shia were included the Ismaili Muslims who coincidentally in that same year in 2014 um, had just opened the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. And I mentioned that just because it happens to be another institution that tells the stories of Muslim communities. Muslims were then and remain today the fastest growing population in the country, on track to become the largest religious minority group by some time around or just after 2030. 
And they are the youngest demographic religious minority with a median age of 29 versus 37 for the general population. They also represent an asset to the economy with proportionately more of them entering the workforce than there are leaving it. Um, and they're also very highly educated relative to the balance of the population. I could go on and on with the kind of information that came out of the research that Dr. Hamdani uh, completed. Um, and I'd sound very professional doing it, um, but I have to tell you, all of that came from the hard work that Dr. Hamdani did for so many years. His work formed the quantitative foundation for what is still an emergent Canadian Muslim identity. And it formed an inspirational component of what the project that I was working on at that time finally became an organization called the Canadian Muslim Vote, which is a multi-ethnic, multi-sect and grassroots volunteer driven organization that seeks to reflect the community it aims to serve. In so many ways, it was Dr. Hamdani who taught us who we are. This research gave broad shape to the definition of who Canadian Muslims are. And I see the work of the Muslims in Canada archive as a natural extension of that work. Um, this project, uh, inshallah, will give texture, depth, and nuance to the description of who Canadian Muslims are. And it will give names and faces to the achievements that they made, and it will lend grief to the remembrance of their tragedies. Um, so that is my, my hope for, um, for Micah. Um, thank you for the opportunity to honor Dr. Hamdani, and thank you all again for actually undertaking this work. Thank you so much, Mo. Appreciate your, your kind words, and I'm also really pleased uh, um, that you mentioned the Canadian Dawn Foundation. We have some of the uh, original board members of the organization uh, attending today, and um, they can also attest to how how in demand that was, that report was um, at the time in 2015. And I remember those days where TCMB was uh, basically formed because of the information he provided. It also, um, Dr. Iman will speak a little bit to, uh, about the report um, that was commissioned by Don in, in a few moments. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, my two colleagues, Dr. Sarah Shah and uh, archivist Mosca Rokai uh, to uh, say a few words. Uh, they were in fact uh, the last, um, I, I think I can safely say they were the last to have an in-depth conversation with uh, Dr. Hamdani um, a few months before his passing. Um, so I'm gonna ask if to turn it over to them and share a little bit about what that conversation was like. Okay, Mosca, you're unmuted. Uh, Sarah, um, as well. Um, all right, sorry. Um, so, um, so uh, last year in around August, uh, in August 2019, we, uh, Sarah and I went to Ottawa to see Dr. Hamdani and um, we had a very in-depth conversation with him and we're just uh, going to share with you um, what we talked about and some of the questions we asked. Yeah, and so Mosca was talking to Dr. Hamdani about the archive, and I uh, was interested in, in learning more about his statistical uh, data use, like what his methodology was and how he decided on what to study. I also wanted to know more about his motivations for the research that he conducted, um, especially since he was a trailblazer in that line of work. He said that a Muslim organization had reached out to him, asking him to take part in a seminar at the Toronto School of Theology. The event was on minorities and they wanted Muslim speakers for a day session. Dr. Hamdani said that the area was not his focus in research, but that the organization had reached out to other people and unfortunately no one was willing to talk on Muslims in Canada. Um, so even though he felt he didn't know things yet, especially at that time, because really there was nothing written or published on Canadian Muslims yet, still he gave a presentation and that talk was published in the journal the Institute of Muslim Minority Affairs in 1984. And we'll email a copy of that article um, to participants so you can read it too. The article publication was picked up by some American researchers, which encouraged Dr. Hamdani to continue his line of work. He said, there was so little knowledge and people were hungry to know about Canadian Muslims. And that is still the case today. 
Anyway, he decided to start with statistical data and then he became interested in case studies and learning about the earliest Muslims in Canada. And I'll turn it back to Mosca. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, from these case studies, um, he uncovered like um, uh, Mo, uh, sorry, like Hassam and uh, the others mentioned, um, he uncovered the story of the first documented Muslims in Canada, so sort the of Scottish loves, uh, love family who arrived in the mid 18th, 1800s. Um, a story actually that we'll go into more greater detail in the second webinar of the series in um, next week, December, December 15th. Uh, my, my main questions though for Dr. Hamdani that day were focused on how he unearthed those stories about the early Canadian Muslims. And he reported to us that he started with, um, like Sarah said, census data and statistics. Um, I wanted to know though, if he had any more sources or if he found it hard to find primary sources uh, for that nuanced and those nuanced and rich, uh, the nuanced and rich information. Um, in general, uh, he reported difficulties in finding sources outside of the census, statistics and government surveys, um, which um, are limited in their scope of information. The details of these peoples that he found, um, the lives, their lives aren't reflected in numbers and data. Uh, in any case, aside from these sources, he did mention that the National Archives um, was able to point to certain names and families, and uh, but it was up to him then to look for those names and censuses to find basic information about them before finding any more um, specific details about their lives. The entire conversation made me realize the sheer amount of time, effort, and digging Dr. Hamdani had to do in order to uncover the existence of these pioneers, um, in order to bring these narratives into Canada's historical fabric. And it further became apparent the urgency and need for a dedicated archive of sources on and about Canadian Muslims, so that these legacies are no longer buried in basements, closets, and attics. And um, I'll turn it back to Fatima then. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Sarah Mosca. I'm sure it was hard to piece that together. I know you shared with me what a heartfelt experience that was meeting uh, Dr. Hamdani, but thank you for doing that. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Iman to please share a few words about um, Dr. Hamdani as well. And if you can uh, then just uh, take us right into Mosca's presentation, that would be greatly appreciated. Sure, thanks. Um... So a couple of things, you know, what's, what I'm hoping we can take away is that um, like many of the people that we've been meeting in the furtherance of MICA, we've been working with pioneers and Dr. Hamdani was exactly that, a pioneer who began a project, a project of trying to make Muslims visible, uh, make them visible through numbers, through uh, which is what speaks to policymakers to, uh, to, make them, uh, to make them visible through large data set analysis when it's not oftentimes easy to find them and to try to identify some of the challenges that the community faces when you in when you correlate muslim identity with so many other factors um, around income level education postal code information these are things that uh, by manipulating data he was able to do and that our own our own team dr dr shah herself has done in her 29 report which i just checked is also which is a, an updated version and an assessment of where are Muslims in large data sets today? And uh, as of today, that report's been reviewed uh, almost 1200 times. Our, our interest here is in, in MICA is to recognize that Muslims have an impact to make in Canada. And more importantly, the story of Muslims in Canada cannot be amalgamated as if it's just some broad North American story with deference to the American context. As a professor of Islamic studies, I'm a medievalist. I mostly study medieval dead people. I don't study modern people. I don't study Islam in Canada or the United States or Europe. Mm -hmm. However, as someone in the field, I can tell you when we think of Islam in, in we, we think of the study of Islam today, the centers of knowledge production are Europe and the United States. And Canada doesn't get featured in that conversation. But Canada is a distinctive country that has its own political culture that makes for Muslimness in this country different than what you see, for instance, in France, than what you see, for instance, in the United States. 
my colleagues in France, we have a partnership with, uh, with Sciences Po in France. They can't ask some of the large data questions that we're asking because the government of France doesn't allow those metrics to even exist in the data, in the data framework. Um, and when we even think about archives, they're not present except in the context of museums that collect materials through earlier European colonial aggression. So what MICA is, is an attempt to, to try to make and inscribe the Muslim contribution to Canada in large scale institutions. Uh, Mosca's environmental analysis, environmental scan of the landscape here in Canada around uh, archival practices suggests that we are not present. Library Archives Canada, Archives Ontario, other major archival institutions don't represent us. And when they do feature things that have Muslims in it, the language they use it comes out of 19th century Orientalist um, lexicons. And so even the framework of how we're captured isn't by us. We're not, we, our voices aren't there in describing the metadata nor in the materials. And so it's with that intention of trying to locate an archive in a nearly 200 year old institution that is the University of Toronto, that MICA is, is what we think to be a continuation of Dr. Hamdani's attempt. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mosca, our archivist, who has been working for over a year uh, on how to make sure that, that MICA is an archive that maximizes professional standards of archival practices, while at the same time re uh, re remaining a community engaged archive, one that reflects the diversity and distinctiveness of a very vibrant Muslim community. And so with that, although I know public speaking isn't her favorite thing, but, an, but archival practice is something that she excels in and has already been recognized by the Archival Associations of Canada and elsewhere as a, as a, as a, as a young leader in the field. So we're really lucky to have her. We're hoping to continue keeping her. Uh, and we, uh, and Mosca, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Amber, for that um, wonderful introduction. Uh, before I start talking about Micah, I wanted to reflect on the fact that we're gathered here virtually to remember the legacy of a hardworking, kind, humble, and wise man of our community. Although, like I mentioned, I met him only once, his modesty and humility were immediately evident from the beginning uh, when he asked to be called Mr. Hamdani and not Dr. Um, and with his passing, we as a community are prompted to consider this concept of legacies and memory. Aside from tributes such as this one, how else do we honor and preserve the legacies of our community, Canadian Muslim communities, into the future? How do we tell the stories of Canadian Muslims such as Dr. Hamdani's and highlight their contributions to Canadian society for future generations to discover? We can all agree that Dr. Hamdani's story as a Muslim in Canada, his legacy and contributions to Canadian society are enormous, priceless, and yet largely unknown to those outside of Muslim communities. An archive, specifically MICA here, can change that. It can ensure stories that are not lost, it can ensure that stories are not lost and that Canada's historical record includes Muslim lived, lived experiences. Because while well, Canada's story is made by the many, including its Muslim population. And despite Canada being proud to define itself by its diversity, despite having made and continuing to make significant contributions across all facets of Canadian life, Canadian Muslim communities have had their representations, stories, and identities shaped by near, uh, mainstream media, overwhelmingly non-Muslim, and burdened with narratives of terrorism, war, violence, Islamophobia, and extremism. The time is now to seize our narrative power. It is our time to seize our narrative power and shift our representations. Other religious communities um, have been telling their own stories for decades. Um, so I have some examples here. So for example, the United Church of Canada archive has existed informally since the 1930s and formally since 1952. 
the Ontario Jewish Archives was established in 1973, the Mennonite Archives of Ontario since the 1960s, and the Presbyterian Church in Canada began collecting archival materials in 1879. It is our time. And actually, Micah presents itself at a very opportune time. There's a growing momentum amongst a minority and marginalized communities whose story has been told to rather than told from who are seizing our narrative power, who, who are seizing their narrative power. Canadian society, and especially the archival landscape today, embraces the idea of communities telling their own stories in their own words. A lot of this momentum is thanks to decades long efforts from uh, Indigenous groups and other marginalized groups in Canada, especially during the social movements of the 1970s and 80s, uh, to fighting for a share of that pen to write their stories. So for example, um, the archives began in 1973. And today there are a number of Indigenous archival projects as well, such as the Voices of Amiskwasi, a digital archive that supports the Indigenous community in Edmonton. But this is all to say that I just want to emphasize that other religious organizations, other religious communities, and other marginalized communities are already preserving their histories. And we need to be doing the same. How we do that work is through MICA. A MICA empowers Muslims to take the reins of their own narratives. The Muslims in Canada Archive is a collaborative and participatory archival initiative out of the Institute of Islamic Studies at U of T to collect and share the history and documentary heritage of, of Canadian Muslim communities. MICA is participatory in that it aims to work with Canadian Muslims to guide us in our practices. We center continuous and collaborative consultation in our work, which means that we want to make sure that we are always talking to you in order to reflect your needs in the project. And on that note, MICA is governed by policies that aim to ensure that our practices reflect the diversity of Canadian Muslim communities, while also keeping in mind professional archival practice. And MICA is not just a small one person project out of the Institute either. Uh, we intend to last a lifetime in order to preserve your lifetimes. We're fortunate enough to have the support of the Ontario Provincial and Canadian Federal Archival Bodies, Archives Ontario and Library Archives Canada respectively, who especially provide guidance in archival practice. We also have relationships and partnerships with the National Council of Canadian Muslims, the Muslim Association of Newfoundland and Labrador, InSpirit Foundation, and the Tesla Institute, all of whom we initially consulted uh, for this project. So far, we have consulted with these organizations, but we are always hoping to grow our relationships with more community organizations and members for advisory, including any of you. Finally, our academic partners include the University of Toronto Libraries, Memorial University and University Laval. And of course, our own staff here at the IIS are tremendously passionate about this project because uh, many of us have personal stakes in it ourselves. For me personally, I am Muslim and a professional archivist. So this project has made me very determined to be able to ensure Canadian Muslim heritage will be preserved into the future so that you know, my descendants and yours can see themselves in the historical record. My job as a Muslim archivist is to ensure that your voice and all of our voices, experiences and contributions are represented. But how do we ensure we capture those voices, experiences, and contributions? Um, on our end, well, first, MICA collects. So we acquire the records of Muslim individuals, families, or organizations in Canada to document the history of Muslims in Canada. MICA then organizes. Once we have the records, we'll arrange and describe them according to both professional archival best practices and community needs so that they can be easily found and understood by all users. 
MICA preserves. So MICA will take ne the necessary steps to ensure the protection and preservation of the records it acquires at the University of Toronto for future potential use. And finally, MICA makes accessible. MICA will provide access to the records in its archives, both physically and where applicable digitally on its online platforms. And by locating itself at U of T, we're able to draw on the existing stewardship capacity at U of T for the benefit of the Muslim community. Through MICA, we can not only take the pen to write our own stories, but we create our own pen when we tell our stories in our own words. We do this specifically with your records, your possessions. Um, the things you have at home may have archival value. And I wanted to take this moment now, um, take this time to show you all how, how that can be. Here are some examples of what could be an archival record, some stuff that you might have at home. Um, perhaps you have a flyer of a Quran competition, photos of family outings um, or international getaways, maybe some wedding videos or footage of the launch of an organization or masjid. All of this stuff has archival value because they, they may document a Muslim community milestone. Um, they're primary sources that could be used to create history textbooks. They may present um, different perspectives, varying perspectives of how a Muslim community started out. Um, or your stuff may, ha may help with family histories and genealogies. So imagine family trees. So archives are very useful for uh, genealogists to uh, find family members and create your family trees. And finally, some of those uh, organizational records in your basements may be the last record of a Muslim organization that fizzled out many years ago. These are just some examples of how your stuff could contribute to the documentary heritage of Canadian Muslims. And the way um, those kinds of events and activities are captured are through archival records found in your own homes, such as photographs, postcards, uh, DVDs, VHS tapes, meeting minutes and so many more. It may seem like this idea of possessing archival records is daunting or too academic or uh, foreign, but if you just take a look at this list, I promise you that you have some, of, some if not all of these records in your own homes. And of course I can help you figure out and assess if your stuff may have archival value for MICA if you, if you have any questions. So. This is all to just to, um, to kind of explain that Micah tells stories through your archival records. Uh, this stuff becomes your legacies. They become primary sources and unveil stories within, within them with, with your own words. An archive is a repository, a home for those physical and digital uh, documents. And during this unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, you may have been going through your basements now that you have more time uh, to do so. And you may have already earmarked some stuff you want to throw out, but we want to, to make, uh, make sure that you're aware that your stuff may have archival value and may be worth archiving into the future. And just to provide a very real life uh, basic example of an archival record, here is a photo of the Dawn Foundation board members that um, my colleague Fatima here uncovered while cleaning out her closet a few weeks ago. Um, the Dawn Foundation has since dissolved, but the board members as individuals now are working with Emmanuel College on their Muslim Studies program. And because Fatima happened to have a photo of them from years ago, uh, and we now have an image of the Dawn Foundation's um, original board members. We basically now have evidence of the beginnings of an important Canadian Muslim organization. As another example of an archival record, we have here a photo of Dr. Hamdani speaking at the Tesla Institute launch in 2007. I want to thank Kathy Bullock for digging through her stuff to find this photograph and giving us permission to share it with you. The purpose of archival records uh, that capture Canadian Muslim histories and activities is to normalize our images in Canadian history, to ensure that we present our lived experiences of being Canadian, whatever that means to us, and expanding the idea of what a Canadian looks like. When your items are preserved, 
um, when your records are preserved, you build a legacy. But we also recognize, um, and uh, Dr. Iman mentioned this earlier, but we also recognize that many of you may have grown up and may have been taught by your parents, at least my own taught me, uh, to be modest. Uh, so it could be asking a lot of you to think of yourselves as history makers or contributors to Canadian memory. But that's essentially who you are. Your, your legacies, your stories um, as Muslims in Canada are vital to the histories of Canada as a nation. And it is the Muslims in Canada archive that will preserve those like lived experiences, contributions, and voices. Thank you, Muska, for that. Um, as you can tell, we've we've tried to frame Micah in in a certain way that's really about reestablishing the power of Muslim voices. One of which I want to mention because we forgot to list it on on the slide was CCMW being one of our one of our core partners on MICA. We've actually we lucked out in CCMW because Nusa Jaffrey, who heads at CCMW, actually has a lot of library archive experience. So in addition to being an organization supporting the larger project, she actually brings a lot of specialized uh, excellence to this. So I wanted to I wanted to mention that. One of the things that um, I want to, to do with this moment is to simply say a couple of things. One is there, I wanna do a next steps moment about, about MICA, but I wanna be really clear. What is MICA? We are here to hold documents. We're not here to tell the stories. The, the premise around MICA is that by creating a documentary heritage site, it enables you, your children, future generations to tell the stories they want to tell from materials that we collect. It's about creating what historians call a primary source. And as a primary source, it can tell many stories. We don't tell the story, we don't control the story. It's the viewer who comes to the U of T, comes to the reading room, selects the materials from the archive, spends a day looking at it, and then tells the story they want. Maybe it's in through a, a hip hop piece of music they want to create, or maybe it's spoken word, or maybe it's an essay or historical, a historical analysis of a particular issue. The idea then is we don't tell the story, rather we, um, we, was, we, um, we simply create the materials uh, available for others to tell those stories for themselves. And the important part is that it comes from you. It doesn't come from others who are making stories for us. So what does it mean? Um, so where are we with right now? Well, right now we are at the point where obviously archival institutions across Canada have had to take a pause during COVID to figure out how exactly do we uh, acquire, obtain and manage new materials. And Musk has been in contact and close contact with a number of those um, liaising with Library Archives Canada, Archives Ontario and a number of professional organizations to make sure that our logistical models of, of analysis and assessment are also compliant with public health regulations. And so having established a number of those, we're now in a position to begin thinking about acquisitions. And that's why, that's part of why we wanna to, to host this series of events is to share with you the idea idea of the archive, why it matters, why we think it should matter to you. We also are worried that during COVID, you're going to throw stuff out of your basement that we could potentially use as archival materials. I know for, for my sake, I have a lot of stuff that I would love to get rid of just because I want to make space for other, for other things, especially my children's Lego, which I keep stepping on. But um, what I'm hoping is that as you take time to go through your homes, your collections, you think that maybe something Thing is more a recyclable material, I'd like you to take a moment and reflect on whether or not that's true. And again, Mosca's point about remembering we're making history, that we're history makers and contributors is an important point to make. So um, I know that we're running low on time. So what, what I want to say is we have two phases. Phase one is where we're at right now, is we're looking for donations of records documents, materials that you have in your possession. And we would love to talk to you about it. And so uh, in a follow-up email, you'll be, you'll be sent a link where you could identify on a, on a form that we've provided what kinds of materials that you think you might have for us to take a look at. And Mosca then, and, and, and a team of other students who we bring in to support her, will follow up on, on that. We're currently in conversations with a few folks already, which we're delighted about. And our hope is to be able to identify records in your homes that you think uh, belong in MICA. Um, 
and of course we on our end we have uh, we have created the facilities and the infrastructure to hold them so uh, holding them with the University of Toronto libraries creating a reading room at the Institute the Institute itself will soon be moving to a new building and when we do we're going to allocate a special room just for the archive and so from an institutional perspective, we want to make it a real specific space for, um, for you to know as home for your records, where we take responsibility for stewardship. Obviously, um, and what's really exciting about this project right now is that it's expanding already. Our mandate right now, under the terms of our seed funding, is to really focus on Ontario. But I can tell you from a few folks who are here from Memorial and Manal, the Muslim Association of Newfoundland and Labrador, they're already beginning of this project. They have a separate grant to begin thinking about archival collections in that province. And the way we're working it out is that each province's collections will be held at a participating university in the context of Newfoundland and Labrador, it's Memorial. And the collections across each province as we scale up will be consolidated in the MICA, in the MICA digital, digital, um, dig sorry, digital portfolio. Um, that's my mother trying to call, I apologize for that. Um, but, um, so again, working with each province, working with institutions uh, at, at, in different provinces, we then collect and are able to identify where sources are, researchers can identify where sources are, and we create local, uh, local communities around those archives. Phase two, of course, is when we start thinking about endowing the archive, and we'll be coming back to you for that down the road. But the idea for us, of course, is to make, uh, make MICA an institutional feature of the university and the University of Toronto, locating it here in perpetuity so that it survives all of us into, into the long and distant future. And that's another, another conversation that Fatim and I will be having with you down the road. Um, and, you know, just uh, as if I may uh, make a couple um, last minute last minute comments on a few things that we're doing. We are looking forward to, um, to our relationship with NCCM, who's been a great partner on, on a number of things related to combating Islamophobia. They've been such a leader on this front at the advocacy level, and we're delighted to have a, a grant with them to develop the CRA study. Also the CMLA, the Canadian Muslim Lawyers Association and NCCM have been instrumental in helping us develop the hotline project. Everything that we do is in collaboration with community partners, and we are so grateful for all of them um, who have been part of almost every single project that we've done. Uh, so that includes any possible discussions around how we how we expand from a CRA project into something more substantive on Islamophobia. It also expands into our data initiative. As we've been talking today, data is very important. But as Sarah Shaw's report suggests, data doesn't really reflect the Muslim presence in the way we might like. Stats Can has not been asking the religion identity question except for every 10 years. That means disaggregatable data about Muslims is hard to find. Correlating it with Enveronics more qualitative survey data is hard to do in a manner that correlates with our constant with our regular growth. So while we are hopeful that Stats Can will change that, in 2021 they will be developing, they will be implementing a census that includes the religion question. And we're going to be talking to a number of organizations and their representatives are here today about how we can take advantage of that situation uh, and really ex ex extend uh, extend uh, um, and, and, and extend our, our, our reach to the, into the data world. Um, have I missed anything? I believe that's all that I really wanted to talk about, but what I wanted to, uh, to do is, is to say in the coming weeks, Fatima and I will make ourselves available uh, in case there is any interest in any of these projects, whether it's on issues around Islamophobia or the data initiative or MICA, and of course, we'll be following up with you on, uh, on, on MICA itself.